Welcome to our first uh, Lincoln Lecture of the season. Um, I'm a Mac, uh, otherwise known as George McCarthy, president of the Lincoln Institute, and um, I'm uh, happy to welcome you here. Uh, I've asked uh, Anthony, uh, who is the curator of our Lincoln Lectures, to kind of shake up Lincoln Lectures this year. And in one way that he's shaking it up is we're, um, we're trying to actually do a series of talks along the same uh, theme. Uh, and this year the theme is uh, Municipal Fiscal Health, and I'll say something about that. But I've also um, asked Anthony to kind of shake up the, um, the modality. So we're not always going to have a, a single sage on stage kind of presentation in the future, so be ready. We might have other things. We might have a panel. We might do something at dinner time. You never know, right? It's getting, it's getting really wild here at the Lincoln Institute. You just never know what was going to come next. So um, I thought I'd just uh, talk for a moment about this um, campaign we've launched this year around municipal fiscal health and, and uh, just to, in some ways, uh, explain our orientation to it, which is slightly different from what you might expect. Uh, first of all, it's an institute-wide campaign, which means that we see municipal fiscal health as something that goes beyond just sound financing of places, but it has a lot to do with other aspects, like the ability of uh, um, any place, the local government, to be able to supply and deliver the public goods that really support the quality of life for their citizens. And we think that, of course, that's probably more important than the, the, uh, the fiscal status of the city because we certainly don't want cities to uh, start into um, efforts to make ends meet by starting to curtail all the services they give to uh, their people because that's probably not a winning strategy in the long run. But we also see that uh, it's, uh, in, the, in the longer run, uh, fiscal health is the product of uh, sound spatial planning and um, sound financial planning. And uh, really the um, overlap of well, what we like to call like the, the three-legged stool of economic development, spatial planning, and sound financial management. And well, without all three of those things working together, you're likely to have uh, trouble. And uh, you know we've seen trouble visited on lots of places, and uh, certainly the talk here, here today is about um, how places have been um, uh, responding to the trouble that's been visited on them uh, financially. But uh, you know it, it, it might seem self-evident, but uh, to us uh, it wasn't. And one of our partners is the American Planning Association, and we just asked them to do a straw poll of planning schools in the U.S. who uh, they certify to see how many of the planning schools actually required any of their advanced degree holders to have any background in public finance when they graduated. And of course, uh, it might stun you, it didn't stun me to find out that it, in fact, no planning school in the United States requires a um, background in public finance for their planners, which is just indicative of the problem because planners are planning things they don't know how to pay for, right? And then even more troubling for those of us who actually have been trained in public finance, Public finance people aren't really well trained in planning. And in particular, we're not really thinking very well about multi-year uh, financial planning, nor are we very good at being able to maintain capital accounts, which end up leading us to encounter many surprises when the inevitable failure of some long-term uh, infrastructure leads to uh, a big bill. So um, ultimately, we see that we need to kind of um, I guess reposition the discussion of what it means to be uh, fiscally healthy and reposition it in a way that we kind of um, try to really work on all the cylinders of the engine that make us a place functional and successful. And hopefully um, we'll be uh, helpful at that advancing that work, not just here in the United States, but around the world. And um, it was really encouraging uh, with our engagement with the new Habitat 3 process that we were asked to be uh, one of the co-leads on Policy Unit 5, which is about municipal finance, that will be part of the, the global urban agenda for the next 20 years. So we're on it. You guys can be sure that we're going to say the right things and get the right uh, elements on the agenda to help to promote fiscal health worldwide. Which brings me to today's talk. Um, and I'm really, really delighted to welcome uh, Benedict Jimenez from uh, Northeastern University. Uh, Benedict is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Northeastern, and um, he, uh, he came to Northeastern just, re uh, I guess, about three years ago from Rutgers University uh, in uh, Newark. And um, he was uh, telling me before uh, I got up here that 
he finds living in, uh, in Boston a little bit more um, rewarding and welcoming than living in Newark. I don't know why. I mean, you have a beautiful view of New York City from Newark, right? Um, so uh, Benjamin, his uh, research really examines how subnational governments finance, manage, and uh, and provide local public goods. And if uh, there's one other kind of communications challenge we have to help to promote municipal fiscal health, it's getting the public to understand what public goods are because I think we've all kind of forgotten. And that's a challenge for all of us who know what public goods are to try to explain to everybody else why it is that some things actually need to be provided by the public sector and can't be privatized. Uh, but that's a topic for another time. So Benjamin is uh, currently directing a research project that focuses on how fiscal, institutional, and organizational variables influence the process and outcomes of fiscal retrenchment in cities after the Great Recession. And um, particularly, I guess, cities in the U.S. after the Great Recession, although the Great Recession didn't leave other cities in the rest of the world untouched. So please join me in welcoming Benedict, and we look forward to a great talk and a fruitful discussion afterwards. Thanks. Uh, thanks, George, for the warm welcome and introduction. And of course, I'd also like to thank uh, Director Anthony Flint for inviting me here and as well as a former student of ours at Northeastern University, uh, Jenna D'Angelo, for uh, connecting me with Director Flint. Right? And of course, I would like to thank all of you for being here today to listen to this presentation. And of course, there's also free lunch, right? Which is always good news. And this is almost the same as my class. No one wants to sit in the front, <laughs> which is, again, um, quite comforting to me. So this lecture is about the result of a survey that I conducted uh, during March to June of this year. So it's about municipal fiscal retrenchment and recovery in the U.S. So as in any lecture that I give, I always hope that by the end of it, you will find something interesting at least, right? Aside again from the free lunch. So this is the plan of the presentation. First, I will discuss you know, what data are available out there when we talk about city finances. I'm going to briefly discuss survey process that I followed as well as the design. This is just going to be brief. And then I will actually present uh, selected findings from the survey. So when we talk about selected uh, findings from the survey, I'm talking about data that will help us answer the following questions. No? How extensive was the budget crisis in major cities in the U.S. during and immediately after the Great Recession? Right? What did cities do to address the crisis? And what are the outcomes? No? Have cities recovered from this fiscal crisis that some of them might have faced during the Great Recession and immediately afterwards. So this survey is actually part of a bigger project that I am engaged in. So in the last five years or so, uh, I have this Municipal Fiscal Retrenchment and Recovery Project. This is actually a multi-method research project. It involves collection and coding of budget documents for cities, analysis of data from census of governments and others produced by the Bureau of Census, and of course my own survey, and finally comparative case studies of cities involving interviews of city managers as well as budget and finance officers. So I'm just going to present the results of the survey that I conducted myself. Right. So let's talk about city finances, data about city finances, right? And there was just this simple question that I wanted to ask. You know? So what happened to cities after the Great Recession? How are they doing? It's really a very simple question to ask, and yet when I looked at the data, I cannot find them, right? One very good source of data is something called the Comprehensive Annual Financial Reports. Right? So when we talk about people doing research on local public finance, there's a preference for some would call objective data, which is administrative data. And a very good source of administrative data are 
CAFRs, or Comprehensive Annual Financial Reports, which gives a complete picture of city finances. Here are some of the limitations, the problems that I encountered when I tried to collect these types of reports. One, I found out one third of states do not require their local governments to produce these reports, right? which is not good news for <laughs> someone like me doing research on this area. <coughs> now, for two thirds of the states, what's the problem? Well, some of those local governments which produce these reports, these reports are not really publicly accessible. You have to file Freedom of Information Act requests in order to access them. So if you're talking about hundreds or even thousands of cities, that's going to be quite costly and it will require a lot of time in order to process this request. There are also classification issues. This is for accountants. Right? When you look at those reports, cities classify their fund structure, whatever is included in that fund, differently. Right? Different services are categorized into different funds. They are not readily comparable. So you have to be aware of that when using this kind of data. The good news is that you have the Bureau of Census doing a lot of surveys of local governments. So you have, many of you are of course familiar with this, the Census of Government, which happens every five years, years ending in seven and two. So the last one we have is 2012. Then you have the annual survey of state and local government finances. Now, a very good development in the study of local public finance is an initiative by the Lincoln Institute in which they use some of the data here for their fiscally standardized cities database. I think that's a very good contribution here. Now, what I'm going to say might sound like a criticism of what they're doing. I assure you it's not, otherwise George and Anthony will kill, kill me afterwards, right? This is just my own experience using this data from the Bureau of Census in the last 10 years. I've been using it for a lot of years. One is timeliness, right? So the last census of government was conducted in 2012. Until now, the results for the individual files, for the individual cities, not the aggregate. You can, you can access the data for aggregates the results for individual cities are not yet available, right? publicly available. Now, of course, you have the annual version, which they do every year when they don't have a full census of governments. That only covers a sample of cities. Right? And even when you're talking about cities with population of 50,000 or more, not all are represented in the annual survey. And the last one, available for the annual survey, again at the individual city level, was at 2011. Now, George, I was quite surprised that you were able to do something for 2012. So you might have a special friend at the Bureau of Census. Right. I should talk to you afterwards. <coughs> and of course, there is the issue of data accuracy. Right? So when you examine data for Detroit, for example, you'll be surprised to find out that there doing quite well, according to the Bureau of Census. So you have to double check the data. Remember, it's a survey. So sur as in any survey, there is a possibility of you know, data inaccuracy. So given these issues about the existing data set out there, I couldn't answer my simple question. What has happened to cities after the Great Recession? Five years after the official end in 2009, I still don't have any idea what happened to them, right? So I decided I'll just have my own survey. Right? I'll just have my own survey. So this survey is a male survey of municipal governments in the U.S. with a population of 50,000 or more. The sample frame is based on the 2007 census of governments. It's based on the 2007 census of government because at the time of survey planning, I still don't have the 2012 census, census results. The targets, targeted respondents, appointed managers, budget and finance officers. And because the census does not include 
the names and contact details of these respondents, I have to do an internet search of their contact details, names, and position. This was implemented early this year from March to June. So the survey is actually based on a model, and this model in turn is based on a review of the li related literature. So in this model, we see the fiscal retrenchment is described as a process, a process that involves the formulation, adoption, and implementation of what we call retrenchment strategies. So these are strategies that cities adopt in response to a crisis, budget crisis. And there's the expectation that when you have, when you have implemented these strategies, you will see certain outcomes. Right? And this model argues that both the process and outcomes of fiscal retrenchment are influenced by what's happening within the city government, the internal environment, their fiscal policy choices. As George mentioned, the fiscal health of cities also <coughs> depend on the quality of their financial management process as well as their fiscal policy choices. That's also influenced by other organizational factors as well as the presence of professional management. The model also sees this retrenchment process and its outcomes as being influenced by the city's external environment, including socioeconomic factors, state and other governments, and political actors, including citizens and other <coughs> constituents. The survey gathered information on all these variables identified in this model. So this will be a good source for a number of publications. Some of you might argue it's a survey. Should I really believe a survey, the results of a survey? Should I really believe perception-based <laughs> measures of what's happening in terms of city finances? So arguably there are a lot of problems with surveys, right? And here are just two of the potential problems. Threats to external validity and threats to internal validity. Right? When we talk about threats to external validity, that simply means we are questioning whether the findings that we get, the results that we get, can we generalize that to the entire population that we are studying? Right? There's also a possibility of selection bias, meaning that your sa sample, the respondents you got are probably not representative of the population you're studying. There's something different about them. So this threats, this problem of external validity can be caused by low response rate or the fact that your sam sample is simply uh, non-representative of the population you're studying. Now when we talk on the other hand about threats to internal validity, it's simply a question of measurement error. If you're saying that you're measuring fiscal recovery, is that really what you're measuring when you look at the survey results? So this can be caused by respondents misinterpreting your question. Right? Recall problems. They don't remember. They weren't there when the crisis happened. Right? Social desirability bias, which means I want to look good, therefore I will res report positive results. Right? Especially when you ask me about my performance, it's kind of logical that I would not say I have a negative performance. So these types of things might affect the accuracy of your measures. Now thankfully, something can be done to address these problems, to prevent them from happening. Right? So, Quality survey data can be obtained by carefully designing the implementation of the survey as well as carefully thinking about the design of your questionnaire. Right? So in terms of external validity threats, so I simply followed what is called the industry standard in survey implementation, which involves these steps, a pilot survey, a pre-notice letter, two rounds of questionnaire mailings, and I would have more if I had more money, but I didn't. And then, of course, a persuasion letter, which essentially means that I am begging them to please answer, you know, uh, please respond to the survey. In terms of internal validity threats, it's just a matter of designing the survey instrument properly. Right? 
First, ensure them that their names will not be included in the database as well as the names of their cities. Second, give them clear instructions on how to answer the questions. Right? If they were not there when the crisis happened, then tell them not to answer the question about the budget crisis. If they're not familiar with a certain question because they're not involved, for example, in, in the financial management process, then instruct them to ask people in the organization involved in that process. Of course, tell them what the terms mean. Right? When we talk about fiscal recovery, what is fiscal recovery? And formulate neutral questions. Don't ask them to evaluate their own performance, right? so that you will avoid social desirability bias. And of course, there are statistical tests that we can implement to further uh, examine whether we, in fact, achieve a certain degree of internal validity or minimize measurement errors in our responses, which we will do later. So that's a lot of prep before giving you the actual survey results, right? So let's talk about the representativeness of the sample, the response rate. Typical response rate of studies or surveys of local governments in the U.S., 20 to 30 percent. Right? Because I begged them to, I now have 40 percent, right? It's 268 municipal governments out of 664. So these are 50,000 again, population of 50,000 or more. Total number of people living in these areas in the cities covered 40 million. So that's quite sizable. So just some selected fiscal, socioeconomic, and institutional characteristics of our, our responding cities. City with the smallest population had a population of 48,000 in 2013. So you might be wondering, I thought you were targeting cities with a population of 50,000 or more. Why do I have 48,000 here? And that's because uh, the po initial population was measured in 2007. So this only means that there's a slight decline in the population of the cities in the sample. So the biggest city is 3.8 million people. Right? In terms of income, the poorest <laughs> is around $24,000 in 2013. And the richest city is around 121,000. This is median household income. In terms of expenditures, the smallest is around 18, mil 18 million, and the biggest is 8.9 billion. And of course, own source revenues also reflect the size of the expenditures. Dependence on property tax, the least dependence, this is measured as property tax revenues as a percentage of total tax revenues. So the smallest is 4%. And the most dependent is around 99%. Right? Probably it's one of the smallest cities. Right? Then in terms of access to sales tax, a lot of them do have access to the sales tax, around 88%. And income tax, a very small number, 7%. Council manager government, two-thirds of them have council manager government. And the rest have mayor council forms. So let's now answer the question, is my sample representative of the population that I'm trying to study? So I conducted a statistical tests to compare whether respondent cities and non-respondent cities are systematically different in terms of key fiscal, socioeconomic, and institutional variables. Right? For continuous variables, I use difference of means tests. And when you look here, the important column here is really the significance level. What we're looking for is less than 5%. Right? That means the difference is systematic. So when we look at things like compare the averages of expenditures, revenues, dependence on property tax, as well as income and population, we're not seeing anything less than 5% here, which means that there is no strong systematic difference between our responding cities and the non-responding cities. 
and then we conducted chi-square tests and this is what you use if you have uh, dichotomous measures comparing groups on dichotomous measures zero or one right? council manager government mayor council government access to sales tax access to income tax there is again no significant difference between non-respondents and respondents in which case we can to a certain extent conclude that the sample included in the survey or res which responded in the survey is representative of the population we are st studying right? so that's for the external validity now finally I'm going to present the survey results right after a long prep so what actually happened what happened between 2008 and 2013 so I asked the cities whether they experienced an operating budget deficit between 2008 and 2013 so the horizontal line here is just the number of years they report that they had an operating budget deficit between 2008 and 2013 and when you look at the vertical axis that's just the percentage of cities right? so apparently we're not seeing there uh, around 18 percent of them report that they did not experience a, a operating budget deficit between this period right? 17 percent report that for at least one year they had an operating deficit I think the what strikes me the most about this figure is that when you combine cities reporting that they had a deficit for three years or more one out of two report that they experience three or more years of operating deficits so it's not good for our major cities but one problem when you ask cities about operating deficits is that many states require their local governments to have balanced budgets so this no deficit here the 18 percent it's not we're not really sure whether they're doing good because their local their state government might just be forcing them to balance their budget because that's a requirement so the next question I asked the respondent is about something I call the serious budget crisis which I defined which I defined in the questionnaire as a severe decline in the capacity of the government to pay for the cost of delivering services demanded by citizens and meeting other financial obligations such as debt servicing so this was the question this was the definition of a serious budget crisis when did they face a serious budget crisis so the horizontal axis again it's just the years and the vertical axis is the percentage of cities 2008 was still relatively good for the cities right? this is just around 7% reporting that they faced a serious budget crisis this year or that year 2009 was really the worst year this was the official end of the recession but for cities this was the year when they faced their most serious budget crisis 4 in 10 report that they face a crisis during this year then 2010 that uh, decreased to 28 percent and finally 5 percent by 2013 at least 1 in 20 in cities are still reporting a serious budget crisis in 2013 so the next question that I asked the respondents was what contributed to the budget crisis and this was the question that was used to what extent have the following factors contributed to the crisis faced by your city and if you can remember the model I introduced earlier these are the same factors that I measure in the survey instrument factors as social economic variables intergovernmental <coughs> variables external groups as well as fiscal policy choices and the response ranged from did not contribute slightly contributed moderately contributed and strongly contributed here are the results the great recession 80 percent cite the great recession as having strongly contributed 
to their budget crisis. Right? Then after the Great Recession, this is a cyclical business issue. The next factors cited are more structural. When we talk about spending increasing faster than revenues, increasing spending for current benefits or po post-employment benefits, dependence on a few revenue sources, tax and expenditure limits. Right? So these are more structural in nature, but they are the second most important contributors to the budget crisis. And the least important is population change, the decline in population. What is surprising to me about this is there are very few cities which cite a decline in state and intergovernmental revenue or state aid as a co uh, cause of the crisis. So I was not sure why this is happening. Right? We know that many cities depend on their state governments for financial aid, intergovernmental revenue transfers. So I examined that more using census of government data. State and federal intergovernmental revenue to cities from 2004 to 2011. And this is absolute uh, level, right? So when you look at the vertical, that's just uh, actual amount in dollars, right? And this is adjusted for inflation. So this is in 2000, year 2000 dollars. The yellow line here represents state intergovernmental revenue. And the green is federal. What you can see here is that state aid to cities actually declined before the recession. This was between 2006 and 2007, the decline that you're seeing here. And quite remarkably, when you look at the period during and immediately after the recession, state aid was actually quite stable. In terms of federal intergovernmental revenue, you see a slight bump there between 2009 to 2011, which of course represents the stimulus program, right? some channeled to some infrastructure projects by cities. But when you actually examine uh, this, the actual increase is equivalent to one half of 1% of city operating budget in 2011. Not a very big help when we talk about federal aid. So how did cities respond to the crisis? What did they do? Right? If a lot of them are experience, experience a budget crisis, what strategies did they, did they adopt in order to address the crisis? So when we talk about retrenchment strategies, uh, you can essentially group them into five different groups. First, what we already quite know is that they cut expenditures, right? The logical thing that they're going to do. But you can classify that as whether they targeted personal related expenses versus service related expenses. Of course, they also have a choice of raising revenues, which they can do by focusing on taxes or charging more fees. They can also borrow money externally, which means that they access the municipal bond market or internally by borrowing from uh, other funds in the government, such as the enterprise fund. And then you have the favorite, which is the efficiency reforms. You promise to reorganize the government, uh, to contract out service, to use performance information in order to produce efficiency gains. Right? And finally, intergovernmental strategies, which means that they're trying to beg their state government to increase state aid or transfer services to other governments, such as counties and perhaps the state government as well. So how did cities respond to the crisis? This was the question asked. Please indicate the extent to which the following strategies were adopted by your government. Now, responses range from did not use, slightly relied, moderately relied, and heavily relied. So we're going to a lot of data and I apologize if you know I'm bombarding you with too much data. Okay. I'll try to summarize what the graphs mean so that you won't fall asleep, right? especially after eating. 
So this, let's start with budget cut, cutting and personal related strategies. So here's how to read this graph. Right? The vertical axis is just your retrenchment strategy. The horizontal axis is the percentage of cities using that strategy. Right? The colors indicate blue did not use, green slightly relied, white moderately relied, and red heavily relied. So I would suggest just focusing on the blue one. It's easier on the eyes. Fewer cities relied on reducing salaries. 76% of them reported that they did not use this strategy. What they used the most was just leave vacant positions unfilled. It's the easiest, right? So when you look at this graph, it tells you a very simple story. They did not use reducing salary, implementing furlough, offering early retirement, revising union contracts, and implementing layoffs. Less of them use this. Why? Because these are the hardest things to do. Your employees will not be happy with you if you try to implement these strategies. The easiest ones they use the most. Freeze hiring, reducing professional development, budget, and freezing salaries. I think we often observe this even in our own organizations, right? We try to limit as much as possible firing people or reducing their salaries. So that's for personal related cuts. Right? Now let's talk about service related cuts. What did it actually do in terms of service expenditures? It's the same graph, right? Horizontal is percentage of cities. Vertical is the strategy. Blue means did not use green slightly, white moderately, and then red is heavily relied. 71% of cities reported that they did not eliminate any service. The most used service cutting strategy is just simply to defer capital expenditures or maintenance expenditures. Again, a similar story here. When we look at eliminating services, closing facilities, uh, cutting social services or public safety services, these are not easy to implement. And cities tried to avoid them as much as they can. They go for the easy ones, just defer capital expenditures. Or let's cut across the board, the board because it's fair to everyone. Right? A similar story once more. So that's for budget cutting. Let's look at the revenue raising strategies. Again, I'm, I'm going to pass. Um, okay. Okay. Revenue raising strategies. 90% of cities reported that they did not increase sales tax rate. That's the least used among the revenue raising strategies. The most used, I think this is something we are already expecting, right? And there's also a study by the Lincoln Institute which shows this, that they mostly increase user fees in response to the crisis. That's 17% reporting not using them, right? which means that 83% of them increased existing service fees. I'm quite surprised that when you look at the property tax rate and the expansion of the tax base, at least some of them actually tried to, right? For the property tax rate, that's around 37% slightly relying, moderately relying, or heavily relying on increasing the tax rate. And even the same with the property tax base. Surprising that they least favored increasing sales tax rate. So how do they increase the property tax base? Uh, there are a lot of things that was uh, cited in the survey. One of them is uh, uh, including non-profits, yeah. uh, properties by non-profits, oh, okay. yeah. 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 which is tax exempt, right, in most cities. So that was the revenue-related strategies, right? And apparently, not a lot of them also uh, Im implement a tax amnesty programs, as well as conducting tax lien sales. I know in Washington that they do this, right, but not for many cities. 
just a few of them. Efficiency reforms, again, was the favorite, right? In terms of promoting greater use of technology, 90% of them said, yes, we did this. The least use in terms of efficient re efficiency reforms was contracting out services. 26% of them reported that they did not do this. Others reported that they used performance information and even reorganized the local government to increase efficiency and to produce cost savings. Others, borrowing, <laughs> interfund transfers, and intergovernmental approaches. Most of them refinance existing debt. Right? Only 16% reported that they did not use this. But very few, 83% of them said that they did not issue short-term debt in response to the crisis. <clears throat> Again, quite surprising that not a lot tried to influence their state governments uh, to increase IGR or intergovernmental revenue or at least to transfer the services to these other levels of government. I think, again, that's the easiest thing to do, just to refinance, refinance your existing debt. And there are also, of course, cities also face debt limits, which prevents them from issuing short-term debt, especially those backed by the government itself, not revenue bonds. It's a lot of information, right? I apologize for that. I think a better picture is just to compare the strategies, right, the group of strategies. So. This is what we're doing here, and there's something wrong with uh, the, the computer here. Nevertheless, uh, the horizontal line is simply a gr the group of strategies, right? So efficiency reforms, personnel, service-related, uh, others, and revenue-related. And the vertical axis there is the percentage of cities. So this is average for groups. Red color means that they use the group of strategy. Blue means they did not. So most cities, more than 80%, use efficiency reforms. So again, using performance information, consolidating departments, uh, using more technology in order to produce cost savings. Then the next important group of strategies that they relied on are personnel-related cutting strategies followed by service-related. The least use, I think some of you might already expect this, very few of them relied on revenue-raising strategies, only 37% on average, which I think will have a lot of implications on the capacity of cities to recover from any budget crisis. So let's talk about the outcomes of the process. What happened now? They had the budget crisis, they responded to the crisis, so what are the outcomes? So let's look at the outcomes. I think this is very much related to what George mentioned earlier, that we just don't expect cities to become smaller, right? We expect them to retain that capacity to deliver services necessary for the quality of life of their local residents, right? We just don't want them to cut expenditures. They must ensure that they will be able to serve their citizens. And this is the goal of the retrenchment that was identified in the survey. Nevertheless, I acknowledge that when we talk about the outcomes of the retrenchment, it might involve different time frames, right? short term, medium term versus the long term. Also different dimensions, which I will talk about in the succeeding slides. So this was the question used in the survey. First, let's talk about the short term retrenchment outcomes. So first I define to them what fiscal health means. So if fiscal health is defined as the capacity of your government to pay for the cost of delivering public services demand demanded by your citizens and to meet other financial obligations such as debt servicing, to what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statements? So the first concept I use here is something called resilience. My local government has fully recovered its fiscal health. 
responses range from strongly disagree to strongly agree. The next statement is a concept rep uh, statement representing the concept called stability. The fiscal health of my local government has been slowly improving, but recovery is quite brittle. And finally, you have fiscal relapse, which means that another fiscal crisis is highly possible if there is a new economic downturn. So these concepts are based on the GFOA, uh, Government Finance Officers Associations, uh, short-term financial recovery outcome. So I'm not reinventing the wheel here. I'm just using what is already in the literature. So that's, remember, that's the short-term outcomes. Let's talk more about the multi-year and the multi-dimensional outcomes. If I'm interested about the capacity of cities to deliver services to their citizens, then I ask them directly about that, their service capacity, with this statement. Core service levels are unlikely to return to pre-crisis <coughs> levels in the next one to two years, three to four or five years or more. So here I'm trying to assess the time frame of the outcomes. Right. Now I also mentioned about the fact that we have to examine the different dimensions of this capacity. So when we talk about service capacity, it ultimately depends on two things. One, does the government have the workforce to deliver the service? Right? So the statement used was, my local government is likely to continue to operate with a reduced workforce in the next, again, the years there, one to two years, three to four or five years or more. Not only the workforce, which is important, they must have the infrastructure to provide the service, right? You, have, you need roads and bridges, not only people. So infrastructure capacity, my local government is likely to continue to be cautious about making significant infrastructure investments in the next, again, the years identified earlier. But ultimately, whether government can provide these services whether government has the workforce, whether it has the capacity to invest in infrastructure, depends on whether it has money to cover the expenditures. And so I asked them about something called budget balancing. Will they be able to cover their expenditures again in the next one to two years, three to four or five years or more? Right? So these are the measures that I use in order to examine the outcome of fiscal retrenchment. So now let's look at the results. So these are the short-term outcomes, right? If you remember, resilience means full recovery. Stability is slow improvement. Relapse is we're in danger of having another crisis if you have an economic downturn. Vertical axis is the percentage of cities. And we look at the color. I think that's gold or yellow. I'm quite colorblind, I apologize. So it's strongly disagree. Then the green is disagree, red is neutral, blue is agree, and purple is strongly disagree. Again, let's just focus on agree and strongly disagree, right? To make it simpler. In terms of resilience, 19% agree that their cities have achieved full fiscal recovery. And 8% report that they strongly agree. It's around 27%. Right? Good news, almost a third of them have fully recovered their fiscal health. In terms of slow improvements, again, just focusing on agree and strongly disagree. The blue and purple bars, that's 57% plus 8%, around 65 slow improvements. Now, this is really the worst part here, is that when you look at fiscal relapse, remember, these are cities reporting that they are on the brink of another serious budget crisis when there is an economic downturn. 51% plus 21, that's around 7 out of 10 cities reporting that they are on the precipice of another budget crisis, if there is a new economic contraction. Not really good, right? I think Director Flint reminded me that I should provide some positive results. But I'm sorry, sir. I, mean, I, I cannot change the data even if I wanted to. 
So that's the short-term outcome. And let's look now at the long-term outcome. So the long-term outcome, again, remember budget balancing, service capacity, workforce capacity, and infrastructure capacity. Right? The vertical line here, or the vertical axis, again, percentage of cities. In terms of the color, the yellow means these are not issues for cities. Green means next to one, one to two years. These, these are serious issues for us. Red, next three to four. And, next, and blue means next five years or more. These are going to be problems in the next five years or more. Again, this is not a very good picture of city finances. When you look at cities reporting that budget balancing, service capacity, workforce capacity, and infrastructure capacity are not issues for them, that's one of the lowest in terms of responses. Right? 11%, 21, 16, 16. Just focus on the blue bar here. Cities reporting that they have long-term problems. That's one in three. One in three reports that they face long-term service capacity, workforce capacity, infrastructure capacity, and budget balancing problems. So that's five years or more. That's their assessment of their long-term fiscal outlook. So suffice it to say that I reduced the number of measures and constructed indices right, to measure fiscal recovery in cities. And this was the expectation. You can compare the averages for cities across regions. right? Regional economies affect city finances. So for example, when you look at North and the Midwest, these are the Rust Belt, Rust Belt region, and you have declining industrial base. The West was, of course, the center of the real estate market collapse during the recession. The South is, did pretty good during the recession because of the resurgence of manufacturing, and they were not severely affected by the housing collapse. So what would we would expect is that cities in the North, Midwest, and the West regions of the country will report poorer outcomes if we are indeed measuring right, fiscal recovery across the cities. And then the South, cities from the South will report stronger recovery. And indeed, this is what we found out. So this is just a comparison of the averages. Right? For the indices we constructed, I constructed to measure fiscal recovery. So the higher the value, the better the fiscal outcome. Right? West, cities in the western region reported the worst outcomes, the lowest score, followed by the Midwest and the North. The South, cities in the South are performing quite well, or perform quite well after the crisis. And these differences in the averages are systematic. So they are statistically significant. What we see here, this is just a reflection of the lingering effects of the housing market collapse. Remember California, Nevada, and Arizona, right? And we're talking here about short-term fiscal outcomes, the fiscal recovery. In terms of the long-term outcomes, right, the measures on uh, service capacity and budget balancing, again, there's an index which I constructed. Higher values mean better outcomes. Lower means worse outcomes. The North and the Midwest, this is again our averages for cities. The North and the Midwest are not doing good in terms of their long-term fiscal out outlook. The West comparatively is better, but the South is even better. Right? So what is happening here? It's, I think, just a reflection of the industrial decline in the Midwest and the North. So this is their long-term fiscal outlook. And then I'm going to not present this <laughs> summary. Okay. As always, I mentioned I was hoping that I did not waste your time. So these are the major takeaways. Crisis. When we talk about the new normal of multi-year budget deficit, the term new normal, it's not just a fancy term. It actually happened. We have cities that report multi-year budget crisis. Right? 
in terms of the causes of the crisis, the business cycle was the most important, right? the Great Recession. But there are also structural causes which contributed to the crisis. Rising spending, uh, declining revenues, tax and expenditure limits strongly contributed to the crisis. Surprisingly, federal and state IGR played a minor role. In terms of responses, cities did the easy things first, which we should expect. Right? Efficiency reforms followed by cutting capital expenses, which I believe will have huge implications in terms of the quality of local infrastructure. If more cuts are needed, focus on personal, personal expenses, not on services. I believe this is a reflection of some of the findings in studies that citizens want a smaller government but don't cut the services that they receive. Therefore, the choice of the city government is to focus on expenses for personnel. Right? Of course, in the future, that's going to affect, affect the quality of the service. Rely more on user fees than on tax increases, right? which is, again, is not surprising, but there are issues involved here. Economies love user fees because it's a way of market-based pricing. Right? which leads to better resource allocation. But there are equity concerns, however, especially when you talk about access to public services by uh, poorer residents of cities. If you need to increase taxes, then please don't touch the sales tax. It seems to me that there is greater competition for cities, among cities, for businesses, and that's why they're quite scared to touch the sales tax rate because they don't want to drive away these businesses. We're talking about bigger cities, so businesses play a bigger role in their lo uh, local revenues. In terms of outcomes, again, I apologize to Director Flint, but these are not terribly inspiring when we talk about short and long-term fiscal health of cities. There are big issues for them. Short-term fiscal recovery, that is just a reflection of the housing market collapse, right? but the long-term one is a reflection of broader uh, structural economic issues, especially the decline of the industrial base in some regions in the country. So that's a big question. It's really linked to the economy. What's happening to our cities is linked to the re national and regional economies. So the big questions, I end with some uh, big questions, which I will not answer here. I, hopefully you can for me. Uh, what can cities do, right? given these problems, given the importance of the economy, what can they do? Or perhaps they can't do that much, in which case other level, levels of government should do something, state or federal. But are they willing to? I think those are two big questions that I'm trying to answer. Thank you very much for your time. I'm a little bit puzzled um, with how much of that is actually a consequence of the crisis. Um, if you haven't done a counterfactual to the most of your, your service, would that, I would suspect that most of them would say that they, they have wrong long-term problems of financing infrastructure. This, was a, this is not something new for many of the municipalities in this country. Mm -hmm. So a number of these things are patterns that are probably pre-existed in the crisis. Um, I just wonder why, mm -hmm. if this is a, of any relevance for your, for your analysis or not. Um, and, the, and the second one is a very short one. Um, in your survey, did you ask any, any questions of, to, of consistency? Say when you ask two or three questions that to check whether if you respond one as a yes, you should have responded to the other two as yes as well. Mm -hmm. So just to check the, the other responses. I uh, asked the first question. Unfortunately, this is a cross-sectional survey, yeah. so we cannot really tell for sure which preceded what in terms of cause and effects. And I'm not really saying well, anything. Yeah. If you would have done something before mm -hmm. the crisis, the same type of of survey. What kind of, uh, would that be, uh, the answer be that different? No idea. No. 
but then, then it's hard to say that. <coughs> That's true, yeah. Uh, and in terms of the second question, which I forgot. Consistency. Uh, the consistency of responses, right? So there were a lot of statistical tests done in order to ensure that those responses are consistent, the simplest of which is correlation analysis. So unfortunately, I did not have a lot of time to present them, but they were uh, highly correlated and statistically significant. Also, in terms of the questions, well, one sh uh, I think I believe that they are not mutually exclusive. Right? So we, for example, when we compare slow recovery and physical relapse, right? those are closely related as far as I'm concerned. Th those are not mutually exclusive. You can experience slow recovery, but you are in danger of physical relapse if there is an economic downturn. <coughs> what is exclusive is if you report that you are in full physical recovery, then it's impossible for you to report that you are will be in fiscal relapse. So tests were done in order to examine the consistency of those responses. I apologize if I did not have time. Yeah. Um, one general observation uh, on the what can cities do, and then one very uh, sort of specific question. Uh, I've recently heard a, an interesting um, recommendation from an advocate of the so-called new urbanism that cities need, and fiscal future stability need to be really careful when they ra raise bond revenues or take federal and state uh, support, mm -hmm. that the infrastructure expansion is planned so that the land use patterns that it encourages are sufficiently dense and <coughs> revenue generating that it pays for the long term uh, maintenance mm -hmm. uh, of the infrastructure that they've built. So mm -hmm. I, I thought that was a very interesting kind of thoughtful response. And then just one very uh, small question. Um, on, the, on the range of responses that you identified, um, I w from a very limited local experience, I was expecting to see one that, that did not appear, and I'm just curious if it's if something you considered. Sure. And that is um, the uh, tapping of um, uh, reser uh, reserve or rainy day funds mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, to uh, balance budgets in the short term. I apologize for that. It, it was there. The question was there. Uh, it, it wasn't included in the presentation. A lot of them used their uh, fund balance to cover the short-term crisis. That's why so few of them went into problems in the first year, but then mm -hmm. they showed up in the second. That's right? true. That's true. Yeah. You did like a good, like regional stratification of results, but mm -hmm. what happens when you look at like population ranges, like the fifty to hundred thousand range, hundred mm -hmm. to five hundred mm -hmm. to five hundred up? Yeah. That's true. I, I haven't done that. So I just finished uh, encoding the results uh, the past October and earlier this month. So this is the first time I'm looking at the data. So, but what I can tell you is that there are results here for an employment rate. Right? You might argue that you know, when we look at regional differences, that mass are great differences across cities. So focus on what's happening in individual cities. And the best measure of local economic, uh, the, the state of local economy is the unemployment rate in the cities, right? So this is a correlation of the fiscal recovery index and unemployment rate. Correlation is quite strong at negative 0.6, right? Highly significant at less than 1%. Means that cities which have high unemployment rate score the lowest in the fiscal recovery index, which is what you would expect. They are having fiscal difficulties, which is a reflection of their local economy. But I think that's a good suggestion to look at different population sizes because possibly of the difference in economic structure across those population sizes. Uh, for each of your cities that you selected, did you get a capper for each of those in your, in your sample? They're not available for all of them. So did you consider checking to see if they'd sold bonds at any time recently. Most bond issues include a, a capper and better than the initial statement. Mm -hmm. That might be a good mm -hmm. way to check. Mm -hmm. Secondly, if you don't have that information, how reliable are the responses? Mm -hmm. How certain are you that, that they're giving you what you really want to know? That's why we conducted this correlation analysis, no? uh, especially regional a comparison of uh, what they reported as the state of fiscal recovery as well as this correlation analysis between fiscal recovery and unemployment rates. So there is no claim here that you know 
These are per perfect measures. Indeed, I started the presentation by arguing that I can't, I don't have access to the data that I really need, the coffers. If only I do, then I need not do the survey. You know, different states, there are different uh, municipal officials who are responsible for doing the CAFR. And whether it's the finance director or the city auditor, if you go to their website, you will find it available on their website. Oh, yes, that's, that's absolutely true. But as I mentioned earlier, one-third of states don't require their local governments to produce coffers. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that. I haven't done a survey, but I would tend to disagree with you about that. It might not be formal language, but I think they generate it un under some, some aspect of state law, they have to generate an annual financial report. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a background, I collected coffers for 2,000 municipalities for from 2008 to 2013. So that's 2,000 times six years is 12,000. And I enco encoded that, right? I still did not cover those one third of states which did not require their local governments to produce. Oh, it's, it's, it's a lot of hard work, I agree. I wish it was there, you know, yeah. I really do. So what is your, um, what's your plan uh, now? Because you've uh, been able to do some pretty good kind of um, analytics, a little bit of description on and characterizing different cities. But mm -hmm. my guess is that now you're going to try to do some kind of deep dive. Are you going to take a look at resilient cities and see what characterizes their um, recovery and mm -hmm. take a look at the, their whole story with a case study? Yeah. Are you going to you know look at the others as well? And mm -hmm. These are the questions that I will be answering in the near future. Well, uh, four papers actually are currently under review, uh, just answering the question, what can cities do? For example, if they try to increase capital expenditures, will that put them in a better position? Right? Under the assumption that when you uh, invest more in capital projects, the short-term effect is that you will be increasing employment in the city. The long-term effect is that you will be increasing the assets owned by the city, which is good for the local economy, things like that. Or is borrowing a good strategy when you have uh, phys a fiscal crisis? Or how about the quality of the local public management, right? Something which is very important. Uh, if you have a professional government, does that matter in terms of the fiscal performance of the city? How about states? Does an increase in state aid help cities? In uh, responding to a budget crisis. So many of those factors identified in the model, those will be a subject, subject to the study, future studies as well as a book, <coughs> including those case studies to provide more qualitative answers to some more difficult questions to answer. Did you keep profiles um, understanding kind of the backdrop of each city that was selected within your sample to understand whether or not, for instance, they were, they had a high debt profile that would mean that you know, of how they would evaluate refinancing, for instance, the strategy, mm -hmm. and for example, the underappreciation of tax and expenditure limitations, whether they were in a jurisdiction in the state that actually was really relaxed and mm -hmm. were own source revenues um, and raising them had a lot of flexibility outside of the constitutional structure. Some of the results are really surprising mm -hmm. around yeah, those sure. developments. And I have a paper which I just finished on tax and expenditure limits. So the, sam the sample frame, that's based on the census of government. So they just listed all those municipalities with a population of 50,000 or more. So I did not select, right? I just sent all the survey questions to all those governments with a population of 50,000 or more. And 40% of them responded and then conducted, I conducted additional analysis whether my sample is representative. So in terms of, again, the presentation earlier in terms of key economic, social, and fiscal variables, they are quite representative. And but as to your question about the effects of state uh, tax and expenditure limits, other fiscal institutions, that's a subject of a different paper, which I'll be glad to share with you the results of. Are you planning to follow this group of cities over time to see, for example, how the different strategies work and don't work? Mm -hmm. Uh, it depends on how persuasive I can be in terms of begging people to give me money. <laughs> uh, given the differences you're getting across regions, north, south, east, and west, 
Is there anything in there that would suggest that, that this would be more federal involvement uh, to sort of normalize the, uh, the problem? One of the books that I really like was the book by Professor Ladd and Yinger, uh, Ailing Cities, if I, if I believe that, if I remember. That's, that was 1989. And their argument was that cities cannot really do much in terms of promoting their fiscal health. Which means what? That state and the federal government needs to do something to help those cities. And somehow I'm beginning to believe their argument. Especially when you see this, because the differences here by region, by unemployment rate, it tells you that what's happening with city finances is a reflection of the state of the economy, both short-term and long-term state of the economy. If that is the case, cities cannot influence the state of the economy. If they cannot influence the state of the economy, then what will happen to them? Minor adjustments? Will that be enough? There are 40 million people covered in this study. If one in three cities are facing long-term fiscal problems, that's it? Let's, let's, let's just then face these problems by themselves. So that's a big question. But the next big question really is, are state and federal governments, are they willing to do something? And my belief is probably no. Right? Probably no. I'm still troubled, but how many cities faced this kind of problems before? It had been over the long run. I'm talking about now the last 20 years, 30 years. How many of them? What is the percentage of the municipalities that did, for instance, have operating a, a deficit, have been working systematically with that during long periods? How many of them have actually I big issues regarding uh, um, investments in infrastructure or things like that? Sure. Uh, I, I don't have a comparative uh, survey, so... We, yeah. It's hard for us to, to understand how the gravity of the situation today. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to sort of follow on on Martin. You know, the term fiscal stress was invented back in the 70s. Right. So it's, it's, I mean, the answer is, yeah, they've been, cities have been under fiscal stress for 40 years. Yeah, yeah, for 40 years. Of course. So it's, it's yeah, not exactly no fiscal stress. So. <laughs> but let me, let me make two other <coughs> suggestions for you. Um, one is property tax <coughs> receipts to, to cities typically lag a year. I mean, you have reassessments, you have, and so that may also explain why the first year wasn't a disaster, because sure, right. it took a while for the property tax falls to hit. Right. Um, the second thing, and, and it's something I really agree with you, uh, but it does put you and me uh, at odds with most of the economics profession, is that whether you intended to or not, you explicitly rejected um, uh, the uh, media voter model, because you essentially said, the services come first, and so revenues then are, need to be raised in order to provide a, a particular level of services. That's opposite media voter. And I agree with you, but that means you and me are the only people who are in that boat. <laughs> um, but uh, but I, you might want to either hide that when you write, <laughs> you write your articles, or explicitly say, you know, screw you guys, you're wrong. But uh, that's probably not a good strategy. <laughs> I think the, the biggest problem uh, for me that so far uh, in terms of the, the manuscript is that no one really believes the perception-based measures, they, uh, especially when you talk about academics. They don't trust public managers to report the true things. Even with this statistical test that I did, still no one believes that these are accurate measures, which I I'm quite surprised because as uh, faculty in a public administration department, I'm teaching these public managers. Does that mean that I'm teaching them not that good because they're lying about the state of their <laughs> fiscal health? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, with regard to Martin's question, have you thought about um, adding um, control variables that are contextual yeah. that would characterize the places like uh, demographic variables right. about mm -hmm population movements, uh, changes in population size, other kinds of demographic profiles. Are you, are, so, yeah, you so this is just one of the yeah. studies. So remember, I'm not trying to uh, uh, give you a presentation of cost and effects. This is just a simple result of the survey. 
It's just what I found out using the survey. So there are no arguments here what cost what, what was, you know, what cost the outcome, I don't know. But some of the manuscripts that are based on uh, the study, and one, this is one example of the manuscript that I wrote currently under review. Actually, it was rejected, <laughs> fortunately. Yep. It was rejected because yeah, people don't like uh, perception-based measures. Uh, in what different ways do you expect to publish the results of your, the findings in your various studies that you are conducting? Uh, mostly journal articles and then a single book that I'm writing right now. Because my field of uh, public finance and administration is mostly about journal articles. And of course, I also would like to share the results to as many people as possible and to get more inputs on how to improve this, perhaps to replicate it in the future. And again, uh, to know someone at the Bureau of Census if they can give me their more recent data. In, in your research, did you have occasion for the individual uh, respondent cities to, to um, do a, maybe a reality check with the municipal uh, debt rating agencies to see what the ratings of those individual cities were at the outset and were they degraded or did they recover over the period of your study? Another good suggestion for another paper. Right? Uh, unfortunately, not all cities uh, uh, incur debt right? because some states do not allow their cities to uh, issue bonds. So it's kind of, uh, it's not that easy to compare in terms of you know, deg degradation of the credit ratings you know, for some of their cities. And I don't really trust credit ratings, especially after what happened in 2007. Yeah. In my profession, there are a lot of publications about credit ratings, and I'm always uh, you know, questioning, why am I believing these credit ratings, considering that all of us know in 2007 that not many of these credit ratings are accurate, right? It's better to use the interest rate uh, charged to the bond as a measure of the actual quality of uh, the fiscal health of that city. But I will try to do that. Yeah, your suggestion. It's certainly very unreliable on anything relating to mortgages. I don't know how they yeah. are on municipal yeah. ratings. Yeah. Can you tell us how to interpret this table? Sure. So this is one uh, of the papers that I produced using this study. I'm just trying to explain the differences in fiscal recovery across regions. So this is now, well, this is not cost and impact because this is cross-sectional, right? So this is just associations. So this is based on the model I introduced earlier about fiscal retrenchment, right? So you have the external environment and then the internal environment. So I measured some of the variables there, like for instance, socioeconomic, population, income, uh, the severity of the Great Recession. Then you have intergovernmental variables, state mandates, fiscal limits, your question about tax and expenditure limits, uh, the change in IGR, dependence on IGR. Then you have those external uh, groups, unions, government workforce, the fragmentation of the local population, and then you have the fiscal choice of the city. Is there a, a diversified tax base? Um, they're more dependent on the property tax. Do they have very high levels of debt? Increasing wage costs or increasing expenditures for employ uh, benefits? Then the institutional variation. Do they have a council managed form of government? They, do they have a professional management? So what this, this is a regression analysis. What variables explain the differences in fiscal recovery across cities? Right? So what you see here is that those, this is just a su summary table. I don't want to bombard you again with another table full of numbers. Right? So the red here means that the variable reach statistical significance. Again, 5% or less. And then the number there in blue, that indicates the size of the standardized coefficient. Means that these are comparable because these are beta coefficients. So one means it's the strongest, it has the strongest relationship with f fiscal recovery. Eight means it has the least, uh, the weakest relationship. So what this is showing us, again, just going back to my argument earlier that 
it seems that cities cannot really do that much. Because fiscal recovery here seems to be a function mostly of socioeconomic factors. The bigger your city, the better you are doing because your economy is more diverse, right? Compare Chicago to something, uh, a smaller city. The richer your city is, the better it's for you. Again, makes sense. The worse the effect of the recession, the worse fiscal recovery. If your city experiences a closure of a major local business, again, the worse fiscal recovery. And higher unemployment rate, again, a reflection of the local economy. Reflecting the survey results, only dependence on state uh, intergovernmental revenue is associated with fiscal recovery and negative. But this just means that perhaps the state government is providing more money to those which are doing poorly. And then you have a lot of negative effects here coming from the strength of the union, the size of the local government workforce, and of course the more diverse the local population meaning that you have different demands for different particularistic goods right that's usually what happens when you have an ethnically diverse population and these are the only things that reach a statistical significance for fiscal policy choices the higher your debt the lower fiscal recovery higher wage costs the more difficult to recover from a crisis I have one suggestion. This is really a wonderful study, so thank you for presenting it. My only suggestion would be if you expand it in the future, would be to consider um, whether your sample should be stratified to obligers, because then you would, you would overcome your data challenge and that every single obliger would have a, a securities law and controls requirement to file a CAFR or an audited financial. And in the United States, actually every single state authorizes debt issuance, so I think that you would have a re geographically representative sample and really overcome that. Um, in order to, to deal with that important data. Yeah. It's quite expensive to have a stratified sample of all municipal governments in the U.S. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Benjamin. That was uh, fascinating. I know this is just the beginning of a, a much longer uh, research project. I think there's going to be a lot of stuff flowing out of this as you take a deeper dive into this. And thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us uh, for our first uh, Lincoln Lecture of the Year. Uh, we'll have many more, so uh, stay tuned, and um, have a great uh, rest of the day and a great weekend. So thanks again. <laughs>